Welcome everybody to the American Space Museum. I'm Mark Marquette. We're so glad you're with us today to stay curious. Today we're going to honor the life and celebrate the life of Mary Cleave, a twice early shuttle astronaut who was well beloved in the astronaut community, I'm sure. Uh, and we're going to look at her a couple of her missions real quick and talk about her as she uh, passed away. It was announced on Thursday, or uh, Wednesday actually, November 29th, but apparently she passed away on Monday. And Mary Cleave lost at age 76. And we want to remind everybody that tomorrow we'll have Chris uh, Stott on. Chris Stott is CEO of a company called Lone Star that wants to put your external hard drive on the moon. Think about that, your baby pictures at the Crater Copernicus, where the hard drive station is, or somewhere like that. So you're going to enjoy a great conversation with a very intelligent man, Chris Stott, who has the good fortune to be married to astronaut Nicole Stott. So uh, we're going to enjoy that conversation that Marty and I recorded a couple weeks ago, and we will be monitoring it live for any of your comments. And that segues my way of welcoming Marty Winkle, my co-producer for Stay Curious on here. Uh, Marty, just wanted you to comment there a minute that uh, people do not want to miss what Chris Stott has to say, do they? No, I would strongly suggest that they watch the show. Uh, it was very enlightening, very interesting, and he's very well spoken. Yeah, it's indeed. And he's got a great idea and he's got a great story. And I didn't put up the meme to broadcast that show today because we were doing some other things, including putting together a program I had in works before we learned about Mary Cleave, about some of the drones that are on the drawing boards to be put on planets. And this is the next possibly Mars helicopter uh, that they're working on after the very successful Ingenuity helicopter on Mars. And we're going to talk about Ingenuity successes and some of the uh, inspiration it has done, including it is now official that uh, uh, NASA has approved the money and uh, going to be built for a moon around Saturn called Titan is going to be a drone that you're not going to uh, Firefly, Dragonfly is the name of that drone. It's going to be on this very interesting moon called Titan. And we're going to talk about that today also. So, uh, Marty, thanks thanks a bunch for being here today. After all, he is a volunteer. And we're going to talk more about our volunteers next week and some other things as we get into our December fundraising campaign that we had to put off a couple of weeks because of too much going on around here for uh, the few Indians that we have to put on all that happens here at our nonprofit, the American Space Museum in downtown Titusville. Well, we uh, wanted to mention that up in space, people will see in the sky beautiful lights like this that was seen, aurora going on. You up in the north part of our country or in Canada, in Michigan, might see some spectacular northern lights like this was captured in Norway. But the sun is very active, and every week it seems to throw out plumes, if you will, of solar matter that at thousands of miles an hour going off the sun hits us about two or three days later. And all of this is predicted on many websites. My favorite one is spaceweather.com, where you can see beautiful things like this. Well, there is Dr. Mary Cleave. Uh, her death was confirmed yesterday that she died Monday, November 27th. Outgoing Associate NASA Administrator Bob Cabana, uh, who is also a shuttle astronaut, uh, told the sad news. In quote, I'm sad we've lost trailblazer Dr. Mary Cleave, Cabana said in a statement. Mary was a force of nature with a passion for science, exploration, and caring for our home planet. She will be missed. Uh, born in Southampton, New York, uh, the Great Neck area. I believe her birthday is February 5th. Yep, 1947. Uh, has a degree in science, bio, biological sciences from Colorado State and uh, also Utah State. She uh, uh, had her investigation into civil and environmental engineering. Uh, she was on the crew of STS-61B and STS-30. 30 was a Magellan mission. I'm sorry, uh, 
uh, Ulysses, I believe. Yes, Ulysses. No, Magellan that went to Venus, yeah, uh, was 30. And uh, the uh, 61B was a technical mission that our good friend Charlie Walker was on. I'll tell you about that in a minute. Um, here she is on one of her missions in space. Uh, she uh, was talking about uh, being in space a couple times. I want to uh, work with you here. She famously on a 61B helped film the deployment of three satellites. Uh, they couldn't fit me in a spacesuit because I was too small, she said. So she was a flight engineer on that flight, and flew, flew, she flew the arm. Uh, she was disappointed she wasn't going to do an EVA, but she was just too gone small for the the, the, the flight suit. So she, it was the first mission to use a robotic arm to move astronauts around as if they were on a cherry picker, but in space, and she was doing that. And there's that crew, our friend Charlie Walker on the left, Marty, I sent him our condolences and he thanked me for that. Woody Spring on the right, we hear him talk at the Space Center a lot. Uh, 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 um, you got uh, Jerry Ross there um, and um, the other astronauts, of course, there she is in the middle. This is where it hurts for these astronauts that have been to space together and so bonded like other human beings you can't imagine. And you lose one and as they're getting older, uh, yes, uh, this is going to become more common. 61, that's uh, uh, Shaw's the commander and O'Connor are the other two gentlemen there, the pilot and the commander there. Uh, and uh, Nero Vila. Yeah, Vila is the first Hispanic astronaut above Woody there. And they were the first crew to spend Thanksgiving in space. So what a bittersweet memory for Charlie Walker and Woody Spring, who we met for his good friend, uh, Mary Cleave. Uh, she was the 10th woman to fly in space, uh, and uh, there she is on her second mission, deploying the Magellan spacecraft with uh, Norm Thaggard on the left. Uh, I believe that's David Walker, STS-30 as I consult the shuttle scroll. Uh, Grabe is the other uh, uh, astronaut, and uh, Lee, Mark Lee, on the far right there. So, uh, uh, so that's... Um, now, I want to tell you what she said about moving the robotic arm as we look at this early picture of her and her handwriting there with her long hair. She said uh, the, the arm really worked. I had to train really carefully because there was failure modes in the arm where it can start just moving really rapidly. So I had to be very careful to know exactly where it was at all times. Uh, so if I had to throw in the brakes, I didn't want to squash these guys on the spacewalks and get them wedged in between the arm and the structure and she said that was the hardest part of the whole thing because there was definitely safety aspects of it that i had to be really really careful of because i did not want to go back to either jerry ross or woody springs wives and say sorry i squashed your hubby that was not something i wanted to do she said with a laugh in an interview so uh what a sweet comment there for her job that <clears throat> alluding to it, it wasn't as easy as it looked it took a lot of skill uh, she was honored uh, in Texas Monthly on the cover there uh, uh, with the wrong hair there and there she is uh, later in life giving a beautiful lecture so uh, Mary Cleve made a distance she was uh, involved in uh, Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt in 1991 uh, working on uh, project manor, manager for sea viewing wide field of view sensors, work on oceanography and vegetation. And she was also named the deputy associate administrator for exam, advanced planning of the Office of Earth Science at NASA, the first woman to hold that office. So uh, she's survived by her two sisters, uh, Trudy Carter and uh, Bobby Cleve Bosworth. So. God bless Mary Cleave, and we certainly will be honoring her throughout Stay Curious as, as her name comes up on missions. <clears throat> well, a segue to, from uh, that sad news to the optimism of planetary exploration, Marty. Uh, we've just come through a period the next day or two where Mars has been too close to the sun for us to communicate with us. So the, the five orbiters and two rovers 
have been in safe mode or automatic mode getting data. And one of those has been the helicopter, the, the helicopter that can, the, um, uh, the, uh, the beautiful um, um, helicopter of ingenuity. And uh, in, I'm just, I don't have any other pictures of ingenuity there, Marty. I got this other picture, I guess, after Mary. There, yeah, there we have ingenuity on the surface of uh, the, uh, yeah, Mars there, duh. My script isn't, I, we're missing some pictures, so that now I realize what's going on. There is ingenuity on the surface of Mars, about the size of your microwave oven or your toaster or something like that, a little box that size. Uh, cost about uh, $30 million. I'm going to tell you little things about this that I bet you don't know about. One is this helicopter is a game changer. Rode on the belly of uh, Perseverance that's now in its second year scouring the surface. You can see Perseverance's tracks there in front of it there. But we proved we could fly a helicopter on Mars which only has 1%. 1%. Earth's atmosphere. This is like being on top of Mount Everest and trying to fly something on it. Well, it's because its helicopter blades are three feet across. There's two sets of them, and they rotate at somewhere around uh, 2,500 RPM, revol revolutions a minute. Uh, and it has f covered, it was just to do five experimental flights. Well, it has done its 66th flight and counting, traveled over nine miles in the air, reaching as high as 78 feet. That's, think of seventh, that seventh floor of any building that you've been in. And there's not many buildings in Florida that are seven floors high, okay? Um, and Ingenuity has been the scout for the rover Perseverance, exploring Mars's Jezero crater that we know is filled with water there's a Delta River remnants of it right where they've been for the last couple of years and looking for microbic life in uh, uh, fossil form. Well, here's a couple of things you didn't know about this little rover, all right? It only weighs four pounds, costs millions and millions of dollars. Marty, the processor on this rover is more power on, on, the, on the, this uh, Ingenuity Flyer is more powerful than the rovers. Either rover Curiosity that's a thousand miles away with no helicopter or Perseverance that brought the helicopter. They use Snapdragon 801 processor from Qualcomm. That's right, the same that's in many of our smartphones, Marty. Our mobile phones use 801 processor from Qualcomm. Um, and again, the software for the camera is a off-the-shelf 13 megabyte camera used on mobile phones. It also has a VGA camera that looks down to track fe features. There's no GPS on Mars, right? Because there's no other satellites that it can uh, uh, talk to. Well, there are, but they're not doing that. So it uses uh, inertial movement unit, IMU, which is really what a lot of your mobile phones use anyway to tell exactly where it's at. So a few little facts about this beautiful little rover intended to be flown five times as an experimental uh, craft to see if we could do it. It is on its 66th mission completed. Been very important to send pe Perseverance into a few areas that they didn't think to, uh, plan to go to because it looks so interesting. And of course, Perseverance is digging up to, uh, test tubes, if you will, full of rock samples. Gonna leave them there to be retrieved hopefully in the next decade by another Mars science thing. So what's come out of this is this, is this uh, here's the 20 year concept of, uh, of these rovers, okay. Uh, 20 years ago is when Ingenuity was thought about, all right. And though they thought it would be a lot bigger, you see the blade size there of four meters, that's 12 feet, and the mass of 50 uh, uh, kilo, kilograms, all right as opposed to one or two kilograms there, 2.2 uh, pounds a kilogram. <clears throat> so um, uh, this is 20 years in the making, and this is how science works when you're going to planets. Things are way ahead of schedule. And then when you get there, 
the science on Earth is, is almost a decade ahead of what you're using on that planet. There is a futuristic look at what they think the next Mars Science Helicopter will look like. It'll be able to carry four to 11 pounds of payload. Uh, they have tested the new rotors for this uh, in up to 3,500 revolutions a minute, which the blades are almost reaching the speed of sound or supersonic speed on Earth. That would be different on Mars where the weight is only one third of the Earth's in the atmosphere. It's so tenuous, but to fly in 1% the Earth's atmosphere and do that very efficiently is amazing and has set the stage for a new concept that we're going to take to the largest moon of Saturn called Titan. But guess who's going to copy us as this helicopter has changed the game so much of maybe uh, rovers being used on Mars and uh, uh, that, yep, China has developed their own rover to put a uh, helicopter drone to fly on Mars when they go next time, which might be uh, a year from now. Every two years, Mars is in a position with Earth that it is optimum to launch, all right? The, the launch window happens, opens up for about four months every two years. As Mars takes about two years to go around the sun and we take 365 days, it takes uh, a little under uh, 700 days. So, very, very amazing spacecraft and they're getting a lot out of a little area there, but we're going to go to a place called Titan, which is a moon of the ringed world Saturn. One of the most interesting worlds, so interesting because it is covered in a smog. This is the Earth, that is Titan, and that is the moon. It is much bigger than the moon, almost the size of Mercury. Just Mercury is just a little bit bigger than Titan there. Titan's enshrouded in an organic cloud rich in methane, uh, some of the, 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 the things that we're looking for life very complex carbon rich chemistry here and the surface is dominated by water ice and interior ocean all right and uh it also has on it rivers and and streams and lakes of liquid methane that's laying all over like water this is an incredible world we know about it because we pierced the cloud tops with our cassini spacecraft that orbited Saturn for 12 years and made about 30 close passes of, of purposely of Titan and each time it would pierce those cloud tops with its special cameras and radar. Well, uh, we know this with the surface looks so well. Also, Cassini had a special spacecraft that ejected in about the year 2010, somewhere around there, and it parachuted down onto the surface. And these are the photographs of the mountains as this gondola, if you will, underneath the parachute photographed what was going on as it landed and on the surface and then took pictures for about uh, half an hour, four or five uh, wonderful pictures of the surface uh, that I didn't pull any of those up today to show you. Uh, but this is the uh, looking like from a balloon landing on the surface of Titan. And this is the concept of the Dragonfly, a planned spacecraft that uh, NASA wants to launch around 2028. Okay, we're talking uh, five years from now. Uh, it'll be the first aircraft on any world intended to make a powered and fully controlled atmospheric flight like a vertical takeoff and landing aircraft, a VTOL. Why can it do this? because the atmosphere on Titan is four times denser than on Earth with the gravity one-seventh the gravity. It's about like the gravity of the moon because it's the size of the moon. But the atmosphere is four times denser than the Earth. I just told you on Mars it was 1%. All right, 1 99th of what is, is on the Earth's surface. And we flew something on it virtually in a vacuum, basically. And so this dragonfly developed by John Hopkins University Applied Physics Lab is going to land in a, a designated place that, that, that they've named uh, called Selk Crater. Uh, 
and they think that conditions on this area and what we're looking at here are these cassini images the blue areas and the black that is liquid uh, methane laying on the surface of titan the rest of the surface rock is rocky and icy and stuff like that because it's 250 below zero here so i take the methane out of my air that i'm breathing and at 72 degrees and make it 250 that gas becomes a liquid and here it is laying on the surface an incredible world this is like the minneapolis great lakes up there marty as you look up in there the white areas is where data wasn't taken and, and has to be filled in later but this is near the north pole area as you can see a, a tremendously big lake on the lower left uh well the science is compelling to go to titan uh, the work uh, that they want to do is mitigated by the risks, and uh, this is a place where they theorize that silicone-based, not carbon-based creatures could be living in this methane water, and we go see a bunch of weirdo fish or something. Now, you know, at the bottom of these oceans, I love watching those documentaries where we see all kinds of weird fish that got the lights on them and, and look like a, a feathery bow of some of them with lights all over them. That's life on Earth, folks. As crazy as some of that life looks like, it adapts. It, it, it takes over its environment and finds a way to survive. And this is what we're going to find on lots of moons of our solar system, I predict. Of course, I probably won't be around when we find that stuff, Marty, but I'm going to predict. Well, here's how this mission would work. They're going to uh, launch it, get it close to Saturn. It's actually going to use the pull of uh, the Earth a couple times and then go by Venus. So they get a gravity assist boost because it needs a lot of energy. It's not going to go by Jupiter, which is the first deep space mission not to use Jupiter's gravity. Jupiter will be on the other side of the solar system. And then it's going to parachute down and land uh, on its own four legs, apparently. There it is in the back shell coming down in an artist concept. You see those little white things on the edges. Those are the helicopters blades ready to be. There you go. And it'll land on skids uh, like a helicopter. And you got four sets of blades around there, supposedly. Uh, 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 it will, uh, of course, this design might change. It's done by the John Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory there in Maryland, I believe. Uh, and this is the fourth mission of what NASA is calling the New Frontiers Program. And a couple of those other missions are going to Venus. And then I, I believe a, another one's going to Mars. Uh, it's about a almost a billion dollar uh, mission, uh, $800 million, and we hope to see this come to fruition and launched about 10 miles from us here at Cape, or, or uh, at the uh, Space Force uh, launch sites over there, uh, just about nine miles from where Marty and I sit in downtown Titusville. So hope that works out. Wouldn't that be cool to see? There it is, coming in for a landing, Marty. All right, duck in there. So well, let's look a minute and return for another few minutes here looking at the moon. Now, when I grew up, Marty, when you grew up, you were working on Apollo in the 1960s, and we're coming into December tomorrow where the Alpha and the Omega of the Apollo moon missions happened. Apollo 8, Christmas Eve, orbiting the moon, the middle of December 1972, the final footprints on the moon in 1972. Well, the Gemini Apollo missions and the Cold War, the space race and all that, we thought that moon bases were just going to be a, just a simple reality, vividly portrayed on TV shows, lunar uh, like two, uh, movies like Space Odyssey 2001, depicting the moon as a site of advanced research facilities. Uh, you Brits had a series called Space 1999, which depicted a fully operational moon base, Moon Base Alpha. And, they, you know, 25 years ago, everybody just thought, well, this is just going to happen down the line. And yet here we are at the end of 2023, and the vision remains unfulfilled. And, Marty, I'm here to say that back in the 70s, when you were ending the, the, the Apollo mission, it seemed unimaginable, un, unimaginable that we wouldn't have 
Antarctica style moon bases on the moon and regularly swapping out a, a dozen astronauts a year there or something like that. Well, we don't. But finally, this week, the company Thales, there's a, uh, there we go. Thales Al Al Alina Space announced a contract with the um, Italian Space Agency to develop a multi purpose habitat, an MPH. We got to have those acronyms. This MPH, you might be looking at the first habitat on the moon. All right, doesn't look like much, but neither did our first outpost orbiting Earth. But uh, here you have a hut, so to speak. It's got a door on the right, solar panels for energy, uh, and uh, basically a very cylinder design. Of course, you could maybe put lunar regolith around there to insulate it some from those hard... Uh, where we're more worried about the cosmic rays and the, the radiation from the, the sun that you don't see. Well, this multi-purpose hab has been given a go to build. No costs or timelines for deployment were provided, but the module likely won't appear on the moon's surface before the 2030s. Uh, still, the Italian agency and Thales Alenia Space say this is a historic milestone to operate a habitat on the lunar surface and participate in the Artemis program. So, a couple other things announced this week too, Marty. This is Blue Origin revealing what they're calling the Blue Moon Mark One. I like the sound of that, Mark One. How about you, Marty? A cargo delivery system that the company plans to use to test and refine features for its much larger human lander system. So first, Blue Origin is going to prove the technology of landing at the poles where we want to seek the water that's buried in the lunar soil called regolith. It's not ice cubes, it's molecules. We're probably going to have to exact, exact very scientifically. But here you get an idea how big it is. Uh, it's got lights on it because it's going to be in lunar darkness uh, 12 to 14 days a year or, or maybe even more days a month, I mean. MK1, Blue Moon Mark 1. Uh, uh, I wonder if uh, Jeff Bezos owned those, those Lincoln Mark, Mark vehicles somewhere down the line. Uh, the inaugural Pathfinder mission hopefully will be uh, on top of the New Glenn rocket, which is scheduled to fly sometime in 2024. We've talked about that huge 300-foot rocket. Uh, and just how real is this to happen? as real as Jeff Bezos standing beside NASA Administrator Bill Nelson this week, as Bill Nelson was at the Blue Origin Huntsville Engine Production Facility, and he said he had an impressive visit there. Uh, Blue And NASA is a proud partner with Blue Origin, particularly on their Blue Moon Human Landing System, which will ensure a steady cadence of astronauts on the moon to live and work before we venture to Mars. This is supposed to take 6,000 pounds, three tons of supplies. That's sort of the, what the, uh, I believe about the average uh, that the crew, uh, uh, International Space Station cargo ships take up about three tons, I believe. Uh, so they're planning, there's, this is under construction. There's a prototype. <clears throat> there's Bill Nelson. There's Jeff Bezos, who said, I paid for all this that you around bill come on you guys got to help me out here so i got a little bit confused at what's going of what's going on on the moon because we've been talking about of course blue uh space x's uh starship is going to be the first moon lander there it is in relationship to the grumman lunar module they did it six times we're actually looking at two vehicles going to the moon yes the starship rocket is going to be used for artemis 3 in Artemis IV moon landing missions, all right? They're gonna to have to do an Artemis uh, 2.0 or something, 2.2, because NASA's gonna require at least one uncrewed mission to land and come back before they're gonna put people on the moon to do this on Artemis III. Uh, so Artemis V would be uh, a the, the human landing system that we're talking about here. The this crew landing system will be adapted for human use, obviously, on there. And it'll look similar to this. So there's two, not competing, 
but they've actually given the contract of Artemis five and six to Blue Origin in the, the, the initial land there's three and four to uh, SpaceX there. Keep your fingers crossed, folks, right, as you stay curious to see if that ever comes about. So, uh, meanwhile, the Artemis II crew, here shown here, is getting ready for their free return flight around the moon, which requires the SLS rocket and Orion spacecraft, not the, the, the Starship. That 10-day mission will have astronauts left to right. Reed Weissman is its commander. Victor Glover on his second flight. Christina Cook and uh, who spent uh, 11 months on the ISS, and the Canadian rookie astronaut Jeremy Hansen. When, and they're showing you the free return f flight of the unmanned Artemis I uh, with the moon in the background there. When's this going to happen? Well, they were saying late 2024, a year from now, but B... Expect it to be pushed back to, to spring of 2025 is what uh, I'm hearing from my inside sources, Marty. Doug Forrest, you're one of those inside sources on our Space Coast there. Glad you're with us today. Dave Stangy and his granddaughter's watching today. Well, thank you, young girl. She's our youngest fan out there next to my granddaughters. Carlton Bailey, I'll give you a phone call, my friend, see how things worked out. Tom Celentano up there, probably... Pretty chilly in uh, Connecticut, I think. But glad you're watching. Tommy Usiak and Mark Usiak in the great state, Keystone State of Pennsylvania there, staying curious with us today. We appreciate you all. We're going to the moon. We love talking about it. Here again, reminding you the reality that we're, st we're bending metal and the European Space Agency in Canada, Canada has their part together for the moon base, okay, called Gateway. It's just a space station that orbits the moon about a third of the size of our International Space Station. It's not going to be that big. There is the massive Starship docked to it and the Uber of Orion coming up to bring the astronauts up to it. There's so much technical stuff behind this, including, do you realize this Starship has to be fueled 8 to 10 to 12 times between its trips to the moon and the Earth for some reason? Not sure about why all that is, but they're going to work it out. Marty, I'm not worried about it too much because this is like why we had to go to the moon in Apollo 8 with the lunar module because it just wasn't quite ready. But it was ready for Apollo 9 and 10 and 11 and there on and flew flawlessly. So uh, they've got the contract SpaceX to do it for the first time and we'll see. Just give some patience to them working out the kinks. And of course, it's going to be fun watching Bez uh, Musk blow up all those uh, multi-million dollars starships as he tries to get them in Earth orbit. Here is where they're landing at the bottom of this picture, the South Pole, where craters never get sunlight. One of them is called Shackleton, named after a South Pole explorer, pioneer, never gets sunlight. So water that came from comets and maybe icy asteroids over millions and billions of years hitting the moon have collected there and we know thanks to orbiting spacecraft that had detectors to find this that there's a good amount of of h2o locked up in the soil there and that's why we're excited to go there because with that we can make fuel oxygen and and things to live on water to drink for example well thank you for letting me look back at this uh uh moon situation there yep i'm scratching my head because <laughs> it is sometimes confusing marty and by the way that's a photo i took through one of my backyard telescopes you can see this view very easily uh, uh on any moonlit night so go out and get a little moonshine next time the moon rolls around we just had the big old full moon shining on us well what we have here we don't have an we have another carlton bailey SpaceX launch? No, we don't. But we are, we're always grateful for CB sharing his shots with us and looking forward to the next one. This is astronauts aboard the International Space Station got a front row seat to some rare atmospheric fireworks. On Wednesday, the Russian Progress MS-23 cargo spacecraft left the International Space Station with a load of garbage no longer needed at the orbital outpost. Uh, carrying, and here is a picture that uh, Jasmine Mobili, 
uh, took. She was able to figure out where it was outside during a night pass. That's they only happened 45 minutes, you know. And photographed it as it burned up in the Earth's atmosphere. There's a series of four or five pictures she took. Uh, this is the beginning of it. And um, they had old equipment, household waste, and everything the experts have decided to toss from the space station, said uh, Russian cosmonaut Oleg Konyenko up there, a very experienced astronaut. So uh, always thinking of our astronauts orbiting the Earth. How many are that? Well, let's first look at where that spacecraft come from. Progress 85 is what I thought it was called. But we have up there right now two dragons docked up there, the Cargo Dragon and the Crew 7 Dragon. Then That brought up four uh, astronauts. Uh, and then we've got um, Crew 7. That's going to be their home, their ride home in about, uh, they've been up there, I think, uh, 45 days. Uh, no, I think Crew Dragon's been up there seven, uh, 75 days. They've been up there about three months, uh, halfway into their mission up there. The Soyuz crew of three that came up uh, three months ago, uh, about a month later. And then you got the Cygnus 19 is a cargo ship that they will get rid of and do the same thing, burn it up with all the trash that they can in there. So this is not a photograph. This is an artist's conception that we love showing you once in a while. But this, look at the Crew Dragon Cargo Marty and the Crew Dragon 7 up there. And there we see them right there and there above my head. Yeah, my head's away in the one there and the other one uh, taken by Woody Hobaugh on uh, a mission earlier in the year. He's not up there now. He came back. Actually, that was his Crew 7. This is 6 and a cargo ship, but 7 and a cargo ship looks the same. And I've never seen this picture and doesn't that look cool, the nodule where we dock our astronauts. And here are our astronauts up on the International Space Station right now. Uh, we've got uh, 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 two Americans, uh, two Russians, or actually three Russians, an ESA astronaut and a uh, Japanese astronaut up there. And coincidentally, of the seven, no American men are orbiting this Earth for the first time, and I can't figure out when. So we got the seven on the International Space Station, and then we have uh, four on, no, we got, uh, yeah, four, or, no, three, I'm sorry, three on the Chinese Space Station. So 10 humans are orbiting the Earth at this very moment as we go in tomorrow, December 1st, 2023. So... There's again that beautiful aurora over the skies. Hope you can get out and, and uh, clear your head a little bit. I miss uh, when I kind of get a little cranky. I get under some starlight and uh, just look up and wonder. And I hope you spend time to do that too. Because I guarantee you there's somebody looking back at us somewhere. Though we'll never know it for a long time. Well, Marty, thank you for a great Streamlabs job there. We enjoy the history that uh, of the future history we shared here of flying spacecraft on Mars and a moon of Saturn called Titan. Again, our American Space Museum sends our sincere condolences to the family of Mary Cleave, just not her family, but all of her astronaut brethren who flew with her to space or trained with her. Marty and I being around these astronauts, grateful, uh, gratefully so at the astronaut encounters are getting a greater appreciation, aren't we, Marty, for what a great community of people they are doing great things, continually promoting what they did in space. And Mary Cleve was one of them. So rest in peace, Mary Cleve, and we agree with all your friends. Uh, and here is a, here's a picture again of that beautiful lady. So until then, Thanks for everything. Thanks for everyone's support of the American Space Museum. Tomorrow, a very special rec recorded program with Mr. Chris Stott. He wants to put your family pictures and your external hard drive on one of those craters on the moon. Stay curious about it and learn all about it tomorrow. Until then, I'm Mark Marquette saying we can't wait to see you in our museum to bridge the space between us.